I'd like to welcome everyone here today, uh, all of you who are students enrolled in the class and those of you who are visiting. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, our guest, uh, uh, Jim Herman, who's the director of the Dyslexia Center, is visiting us today. And of course, our own dean, uh, Dr. John Vile, is with us. And we, uh, Susan is not in the room right now, but I would like to thank Susan Lyons once again for all the work that she does behind the scenes uh, to make this series successful and to make our receptions uh, particularly festive and fun events. So if you get an opportunity and you see Ms. Lyons, please thank her for the work that she's doing because she's out there making sure that this ice cream social uh, takes place without a hitch. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College here at MTSU and the organizer of this lecture series. Since it's the first day, I want to begin with a very brief introduction, and then I will introduce our distinguished speaker. In her book on writing, the Southern novelist, short story writer, and photographer Eudora Welty calls renewed attention to the richness of the ordinary and the role of the familiar in art when she asks the question, what place has place in fiction? For Welty, place works upon genius if the creative mind is receptive. Indeed, she writes, as soon as the least of us stands still, that is the moment something extraordinary is seen to be going on in the world. Welty praises fellow Mississippian William Faulkner as the triumphant example in America of place in fiction. Faulkner's fictional Yakna Patafa County is an all-encompassing fictional world, and it is, in her view, the carefulest and purest representation of the world she herself knows. And making reality real, Welty asserts, is art's responsibility, and one in which place plays a vital role. This honors lecture series on the power of place will feature talks on authors, artists, scientists, and other, other thinkers and the role of place in their thought. Speakers from a wide range of disciplinary perspectives will consider the significance of place and space in the creative imagination. As Eudora Welty observes, place induces focus, concentration, and creativity. The concept for this series came to me in such a place, the Boston Athenaeum, where I've spent many productive hours reading, researching, and writing. It occurred to me that everyone has such places that inspire reflection and productivity. Place can also be the very source of creativity. What Welty argues for writers of fiction can apply to other disciplines as well. Writers must always write best of what they know, and sometimes they do it by staying where they know it, but not for safety's sake, Welty says. Writing what they know from where they know it requires an open mind and an open heart, she insists. This interdisciplinary series will demonstrate Welty's observation that there must surely be as many ways of seeing a place as there are pairs of eyes to see it. The impact happens in so many ways. It is appropriate, therefore, that our keynote speaker for this series will introduce us to Eudora Welty and her views on place and lay the groundwork for our continuing discussion of the power of place. It's my pleasure today to welcome our keynote speaker. Michael Kraling is Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor of English and interim chair of the Department of English at Vanderbilt University. Professor Kraling received his PhD from Cornell University in 1975. Before coming to Vanderbilt in 1985, he taught at Mississippi State University and Tulane University. At Vanderbilt, he teaches classes in 20th century American literature, Southern literature, American and Southern studies, and the works of authors such as Faulkner, Welty, and Wright. He's the author of several books and numerous articles, primarily on Southern literature from the antebellum period up through the 20th century, in journals such as the Southern Review, Southern Quarterly, and American Literary History. A prolific and influential scholar, 
Professor Kraling's books include Eudora Welty's Achievement of Order, Figures of the Hero in Southern Narrative, Author and Agent, Eudora Welty and Dearman Russell, New Essays on Wise Blood, Inventing Southern Literature, Welty, Stories, Essays, and Memoirs, and, and Welty, Complete Novels, The Novels of Ross MacDonald, The South That Wasn't There, and a late encounter with the Civil War. Please join me today in welcoming Professor Kraling to Middle Tennessee State University. Thanks. You look like a bag lady here. I know. It's just going to be a low tech talk. I got a bag full of books. Well, I'm. Uh, Unloading my stuff here, let me thank uh, uh, Associate Dean Phil Phillips and Dean John Vile for the invitation to talk to you today. Um, there we go. I decided, um, I don't know why, uh, maybe for um, expediency's sake, uh, to try to conduct this more, like, more or less like a class than a lecture while you guys sit there passively. So um, it's totally within your right if you want to stop me, ask a question, ask for a clarification, uh, object, whatever. Uh, it is, after all, your class, and I'm here to help you with it. Um, again, thanks to everybody for the invitation to talk about Eudora Welty in place. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is reverse the order of that and talk about place and Eudora Welty. Um, you'll see the reason for that um, in a minute. Um, I see from the flyer for the rest of the series that you have, as Phil said, a pretty full spectrum of considerations of what place means in our contemporary experience of it. Um, Hollywood, your own campus plan, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, weird Gothic made up places, um, prisons, which can be a really fascinating uh, exploration of what place does to human character and behavior. Uh, and what I'd like to do today, uh, through or with the instrumentality or help of Eudora Welty and her writings on place, is to explore in a little bit the sort of basement level of what. Uh, place means or how place affects us. I promised to get to wealthy in not too, in not such a long time, but I wanted to start um, on a much more empirical level. So here is what I mean. A couple of weeks ago I drove from Nashville to Atlanta and back in one day. A small business errand took me down there. And you all know that experience, I guess, because Interstate 24 is just, you know, quite near here. Uh, the United States interstate highway system is marvel, really, in some ways, when you think of it. But it's also a blight. Uh, it's a place. Or it has influenced our sense of place for those of us who have grown up with it. Some practically have grown up on it. I remember when it was built in my neighborhood when I was growing up. We used to play on the earth moving equipment. Um, four hours to Atlanta and four hours back. Time superimposed on distance. Place measured in varying packets of miles. And then there are the familiar signs. Waffle House, KFC, DQ, McDonald's, Holiday Inn Express, Shell. And then the same over and over again every time you reach an interstate exchange. And then more miles and the same signs again for the same gas, the same food, and the same lodging. We live and might have become accustomed to uniformity in our places. Of course, if I'd driven well away from Interstate 75 or Interstate 24 on my trip, I might have found a real place. But most of us are leaving those places these days and coming 
you know, to much more, to much more deeply, heavily populated places where the particularity is sort of homogenized out of them. We are leaving these places to, we are learning to accept places as reproducible locations. The lobby of a Best Western in Georgia is more or less like the lobby of a Best Western in Utah. In fact, we like it that way. That's what signage and branding are about. Erasing the particularity, the unpredictability of place and substituting in that spot something we can depend upon and foresee. This is the place and time of, for instance, The Matrix. How many people have seen that film? Uh, three of those films. Okay. <laughs> it's too bad. <laughs> they're pretty awful, actually. But they're interesting in some sort of discussable way. Um, Neo, if you remember, in the first of those three films, hides little reality chips in a book called um, Simulacra and Simulation. I mean, the films might be weirdly made up, but that's a real book. Go look it up in your library by a French guy named Jean Baudrillard. And he argues that in our postmodern time, the ones in which you guys had been born and grown up, and the one in which I sort of grow in, grew into or aged into, our postmodern time is an age of simulacra and simulation. The real is no longer real. The fake is real. The reproduction of reality is real. It's what we deal with every day. The actual genuine or authentic has somewhere disappeared. And in fact, he even argues, or we might think that he argues, that we've lost in some way our ability to appreciate or even apprehend the authentic. We've become experts at critiquing or consuming simulacra. That, I take it, is the PhD version of what The Matrix is about. The other version is just a long spring break movie, but uh, anyway. Um, in fiction, this could be the place where William Gibson's heroes live. Have you all ever read The Neuromancer or Pattern Recognition or any of William Gibson's postmodern science fiction or cyberpunk novels? Anybody? Well, you should read Neuromancer. Because uh, in fiction, this is his place. Um, here's an example uh, of the hero of Neuromancer, who is a hacker, basically. And listen for Gibson's idea of, of place. I'm going to get to Wealthy. But as I told you, there's a sort of a long detour before we get to her. This book was published in... 1985, I think, 1984. Case, that's the name of the hacker hero or hacky, hacker anti-hero in the novel, sat in the loft with dermatrodes strapped across his forehead, watching moats dance in the diluted sunlight that filtered through the grid overhead. A countdown was in progress in one corner of the monitor screen. One of the things we don't notice is that, look at yourselves around the room. You don't interact 100% with me or even the person sitting next to you because you've got a screen open in front of you. And so we live in a, in a, in a condition in which the places or spaces we, we inhabit are largely not always, but largely mediated by a screen presence. That is, a simulation of real time, real place. We've grown accustomed to it. Um, but what we need, I think, or what you guys, I think, would need or would profit, for, profit from in, in your seminar is some degree of attention to your own situation. Just monitor yourself. And, you know, tell yourself what percentage of your time is lived in mediation with the real world. And there are many ways in which we're mediated. I'm basically here talking about the way we're mediated by screens, by digital 
technology, uh, but primarily within the larger category of digital technology by video images on a screen. I just put my phone away and turned it off. But I swear, until the minute I walked down the stairwell to get here, I was looking at a screen in my hand. Um, and that is a strange sort of situation when you think of it. But here's Case. Cowboys didn't get into Sim Stim, he thought, because it was basically a meat toy. Meat is a real person in Gibson's language. Somebody who lives in his or her body in real time, in real place. And there aren't many of those left in Gibson's world, as I don't think there are many, well, you go to the gym some in the afternoon and see somebody sweat, you realize that you know, there are still meat people around. Uh, <laughs> but maybe not as many as there used to be, and maybe not as many who are 100% in the physical body all the time. He knew that the trodes he used and the little plastic tiara dangling from a SimStim deck were basically the same, and that the cyberspace matrix was actually a drastic simplification of the human sensorium, at least in terms of presentation. But SimStim itself struck him as a gratuitous multiplication of flesh input. The commercial stuff was edited, of course, so that if blah, 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 the screen beeped and woke him up. Basically why I read that is that it, you know, from 1980s on, which is now 30 years ago, what's showing up in our fiction is, this, is the norm of mediated reality. Mediated basically by technology that is capable of creating simulacra of real experiences. In this novel, the, the sort of ground level assumption is that you can't tell in the protagonist case, can't tell from one moment to the next whether he's standing in a real place in his real physical body or whether he's somehow mediated into a computer system, the grid, the matrix. He doesn't know. Um, and the plot works itself out basically with him trying to figure out you know, which order of existence, which place he's in at any given moment. He can't do it. Um, there's a follow-up to this novel. I'll just read a little bit of an excerpt from this one, another William Gibson novel called Pattern Recognition, which is about 20 years newer. It came out in a, um, the publication date is 2003. Basically the same protagonist, Case, although he changes the gender, this Case is female. Um, and she's on a basically the same sort of um, crusade as the previous one. There's a difference in inflection here too, and it's important, I think, and I, it's important to me anyway, to sort of put this into the mix for you. This is the first couple of, this page or so of pattern recognition. Five hours New York jet lag and Case Pollard, that's the heroine of this one, wakes in Camden Town to the dire and ever circling wolves of disrupted circadian rhythm. He's got jet lag. It is that flat and spectral non-hour, awash in limbic tides, brain stem stirring fitfully, flashing inappropriate reptilian demands for sex, food, sedation, all of the above, and none really an option now. There's this beginning, I mean, the first couple of sentences, and you're in this, you're in this assumption that the human nature of the heroin you're supposed to be tracking is somehow in an indeterminate space between a machine and a human being. A machine that's somehow on idle, I-D-L-E, and a human being who's feeling what we've all felt, I guess, at one point or another, fatigue, jet lag. Um, and so you're already in this sort of mediated existence. Not even food, as Damien's new kitchen is as devoid of edible content as its designer's display windows in Camden High Street. Very handsome, the upper cabinets faced in canary yellow laminate, the lower with lacquered, unstained apple ply. Very clean and almost entirely empty, save for a carton containing two dry pucks of Weetabix, that's sort of like shredded wheat, and some loose packets of herbal tea. Nothing at all in the German fridge so new that its interior smells only of cold and long-chained monomers. 
And then this goes on. She goes through, he goes through a description of this very fashionable but empty apartment telling you the brand names of everything in it. Um, and the reason, and that novel, this novel goes, pattern recognition goes off in that direction because every place the protagonist goes to is a place that is thickly packed with logos. It's almost like a stock car. You know, there's almost no surface on a stock car that hasn't been rented for the pasting on of a logo. Um, so that places become not only this sort of indeterminate liminal space where the actual and the simulated exist simultaneously, but they also become in this latter or secondary stage a place that is a market place, a place that is outlined, described, and then filled with brands. The next step uh, is obvious to everybody in the room that we are supposed to consume something in all these places. The points that I make are two here. One, um, the present sort of condition of place in our lives is heavily influenced by mediation and simulation. And secondly, it's all, our places are also, or we have become inured to the reality, that our places are heavily devoted to commercialism. That almost everything we see or encounter has in some way be, been commodified. And we, there's very few places we can go to in which we aren't defined in some way as a commercial um, entity. So two things then, the sort of combination of simulation and authenticity, with simulation clearly, I think, being the predominant part of that. And the second, a place defined as a marketplace. Very few spaces anymore where that metaphor doesn't exist. Um, but, Eudora Welty and her essays on place uh, were written, imagined by her and written, and drawn out of an experience that is decades prior to us now. And what we need to do with care is to read her in our own time and in hers. The payoff for that is that we get some sort of historical historical sense of the permutations of what we mean or can mean by the concept of place. And we can um, then place ourselves uh, in our own moment and, and construe, use our vocabulary in a much more useful way. The essay, uh, there are two essays actually that Wealthy wrote about place that are important for us to read and uh, consider. Uh, the one uh, most important, I mean most well known, is the one called Place and Fiction, um, which was written in 1954. Uh, you can do the math, that's what, 60 years ago, right? Okay. I'm a PhD in English, not math, so base, sort of basic mathematical operations do not come automatically. Um, Sixty years ago, there's another of her essays called Some Notes on River Country that was ten years older than that, published, written and published in 1944, so 70 years old. It's important, with all due respect to you, Dora, to keep in mind those, the passage of time and the and the question whether her concept, her thinking about place, how it survives, if it does, 70 and 60 years later. It's a fair question for us to ask. Um, well, to the 54 essay to start with. Welty wrote this essay in 1954. Is it legal for me to ask you a sort of what happened very important historically, especially in the South? In the spring of 1954, a couple of weeks before, yeah? Brown versus, Brown versus Board of Education. 
which changed quite literally a lot of places, not limited to classrooms. So there's, I mean, what I think we should do then is to put her essay and all of this stuff in, in historical context. In those years, Welty made her living from book sales, and she didn't make a lot of money from that, and also uh, by giving talks at literary symposia, which would pay her a modest honorarium and travel expenses. Um, that way she'd get a chance to travel and make a few bucks. She'd been invited in 1954 to give a series of lectures at Cambridge University in England um, to an American study symposium, a symposium basically of British and continental uh, students, some Americans. And place in fiction was the keynote address that she wrote for that symposium. I think it's important to realize again, to sort of microscopically redefine place, she, that to, um, to remember, to think of what it would be like to read this essay in that place. To be an American, a Southerner, and a Mississippian in the summer of 1954, reading this essay about place to basically a bunch of Brits uh, in a lecture hall in, in Cambridge, England. Um, the places change, text. They do, uh, where they're read, where they're spoken, where they're set, they change. This is especially significant in Cambridge because Cambridge was also the home of one of uh, Welty's favorite British novelists, by the way, E.M. Forster. And we get to him if there's time at the end and I'll show you how this ties up eventually. Um, Welty was, as were all Southern white writers of that period, right in the aftermath of Brown versus Board of Education, and before we have to remember the civil rights movement of the early 1960s, in that little window of time between Brown but before civil rights. Like all white Southern writers, she was either explicitly or implicitly pressured to explain her place and her place in her place, if you get the point. Why was there still, in the middle of the 20th century, a place in the so-called developed civilized world where something like Jim Crow could exist? And, Eudora, what do you think about that? What's your place in that place? Um, you have to take my word for it here is that that was a sort of, that was an epidemic question for a white Southern writer. Faulkner got that question all the time and usually screwed up the answer uh, to the point where, you know, he just wouldn't open the door or answer the phone to reporters anymore because he got in so much trouble he couldn't make them understand, couldn't understand himself. Um, so, um, provincial, um, she was, the place that she came from was Jackson, Mississippi. Anybody from here, anybody here from Jackson? Ever been to Jackson? Ever been through Jackson on Interstate 55 or Interstate 20? Okay, you've been through it. Um, you know what kind of a place it is. If we were in some sort of demographic class, it would be classified, I think, as it's not a first tier city. I don't even think it's a second tier city. There's a little anecdotes about that. I mean, Southwest Airlines didn't start flying there until a couple of years ago, so if, that, if that means anything to you. Um, which it means is there's not enough money in there for Southwest to fly a plane there. So it's not, in some sense, um, a big place. Um, and it, you know, it's a provincial place. That's probably the best word to use to describe it. But it is also the place of this book, The Help. You've seen the movie if you haven't read the book, right? Okay. You should read the book. I hate it, actually, but you should read the book. 
uh, because a lot of people have. And this is uh, early on in the book, Abilene establishes, at least partly establishes, the place, Jackson, uh, Mississippi, uh, for purposes of this novel, The Help. And uh, again, time is important. This, uh, I mean, uh, this is published in 1920, uh, 2009. Um, uh, I've gone, uh, over the years teaching, I have gradually become more and more insistent on historical accuracy of knowing when something was written and published. Uh, it tends to help you understand what it means or what it could have meant, what it could mean, what was thinkable by its author. Uh, that sometimes helps. So here's Abilene talking about the place that Eudora Welty, who'd been dead for eight years. She died in 2001. I forgot to tell you earlier on, it's important to know this too. She was born in 1909, two years before Mark Twain died. Wow. And died in 2001. You'd never know it, Abilene says, living here, but Jackson, Mississippi, be filled with 200,000 people. I see them numbers in the paper, and I got to wonder, where do them peoples live? Underground? Because I know just about everybody on my side of the bridge, and plenty of white families, too, and that sure don't add up to be no 200,000. Six days a week, I take the bus across the Woodrow Wilson Bridge to where Miss Leifolt and all her white friends live in a neighborhood called Bellhaven. And Bellhaven is the neighborhood where at 1119 Pinehurst Avenue, Eudora Welty lived. So places circulate from the phone book and the post office into fiction and to film. And over time, it gets more and more complex. Right next to Bellhaven be the downtown and the state capitol. Capitol building is real big. Pretty on the outside, but I've never been in it. I wonder what, what they pay to clean that place. Down the road from Bellhaven is white woodland hills, then Sherwood Forest, which is miles of big live oaks with the moss hanging down. Nobody living in it yet, but, there, but it's there for when the white folks is ready to move somewhere else new. And we know why they're going to move, don't we? Then it's the country out where Miss Skeeter live on the Longleaf Cotton Plantation. She don't know it, but I picked cotton out there in 1931 during the Depression when we didn't have nothing to eat but state cheese. So Jackson's just one white neighborhood after the next and more springing up down the road. But the colored part of town we one big ant hill surrounded by state land that ain't for sale. As our numbers get bigger, we can't spread out. Our part of town just gets thicker. That, this book, although written in 2009, takes place in the 1950s. This is interesting sort of overlap. It takes place in a fictionalized remembrance or memoir of the time when Wealthy was writing her essay, Place in Fiction. I mean, what we have to do, this is what, this is what makes this, you know, study in literature so interesting, because you've got to wrap your mind around all these different sort of what-ifs before you get to say anything <laughs> about what the, what the essay means. You've got to wrap yourself around all of these permutations before you get to say something. Uh, you may even spend, you know, weeks in class before you get to that point, just figuring out where this, this essay is situated. But I wanted to read you that to give you this sense that there are, that place says differ according to the point of view of the person who happens to be from or t looking at or thinking or contemplating about that place. The basic sort of almost cliched categories, race, class, and gender, do in this particular situation apply. You know from the help, if you've read it, that Skeeter can't get certain jobs in Jackson because she's a female. And Abilene tells you right there in that section I read that she can't go certain places because she's black. Place embeds in it certain social mores having to do with class and gender and race. 
Now, one of the reason I bring this up is not, it, it, might be, it seems like I'm sort of undermining Welty's essay, and to a sense, to a sense I, in a sense I am, is that her essay, Place in Fiction, does not take any cognizance of those influential factors. And that, you know, I'm sorry to have to say that to you, Laura, I'm sorry, but we have to read it that way. Uh, it does a lot of interesting, useful things, but it also doesn't do a lot of interesting, useful things that we need to be responsible for when, we think, when we're thinking about place. And basically that comes down to how is place inflected over time and also by race and class and gender. Uh, the answers to that can be really sort of fascinating. Um, so, um, um, well, I can skip that part because we're running a little bit slow. Okay, so writing the talk, place in fiction, must have brought, I'm saying must because I don't know uh, for sure, writing place in fiction must have brought wealthy face to face with her own complicated re relationship to her place. I can't imagine really that someone, she was in 1954, she was 45 years old. I can't remember, I can't imagine somebody as smart as her, 45 years old, thinking about her place in the, in the spring and the summer of 1954, who is not in some compartment of her mind thinking about the racialization of that place. I, there's just no way that that can't be going on in her head. Um, what's interesting then is to read her essay and find the ways in which it avoids or evades saying that. Um, we all do it um, in one way or another. Uh, it might be useful to remember that the place Wealthy came from, Bob, I said that, and that Brown versus Board of Education had been handed down not more than weeks uh, um, before she went to deliver, while she was writing the paper and before she went to deliver it. Uh, that's my sort of prologue. It's a sort of undermining uh, counter, in some ways, sort of counter-reading prologue. Uh, but just to repeat, I mean, I, oh, we live now, and some of you have been born into this age and don't know a previous one. We live now in an era when place is highly and deeply mediated. There are theme parks, there are um, technology is totally capable with computer generated imagery of creating the simulation of an experience of place, which is sometimes indistinguishable from the real thing and a lot of times preferable to the real thing. Um, so we live in that kind of an age. We also live in, a, in an age when places are highly commercialized. We, you can hardly be in a place where you're not in some way, visually or another way, reminded that you're a customer for something. Um, and sometimes you're reminded that you're a customer for a specific thing. How many times have you looked on Amazon to buy something, you haven't bought it, but every other page you happen to open up reminds you that, you know, over there on the side, you looked for these shoes three months ago, have you bought them yet, you know? Your private space, which you think is your private space, but it isn't, is always sort of invaded in that way. So you're always mediated. The space is always this sort of porous thing. Um, then, but the essay that Welty wrote is 60 years old, older than us. And what we have to do reading it is parse out what parts of it are useful to us now, what, what parts are not, and what parts are useful because they're not. You know, what are we missing now that we'll be embarrassed 30 or 40 years from now? It's like, oh, my God, it was right there in front of me. I didn't realize it. What are we missing? Um, so let me read you a couple uh, of the excerpts from Place in Fiction and um, suggest how 
you might go about first parsing what she meant and then using um, later on in, in the rest of this uh, seminar that you guys are having. Um, this is place in fiction. It starts, um, I've got the, well, I mean, you'll probably find it in your library, in the Library of America uh, volumes, uh, but it, it's, you can find it elsewhere. This is on the first, probably the first page. This is the second paragraph. Um, she starts off the essay by saying, this is very interesting and typical sort of Eudora Wealthy um, way of doing it. She starts off her essay by saying, place is one of the lesser angels that watch over fiction. Or place is all just not that important, really. It's, you know, second, third, maybe fourth place. And then you get, by the time you get to like the third page, place is everything. <laughs> place means everything. It determines the whole Megillah. Um, so you've got to watch her. You've got to read her carefully. Because, and I tell you this because I've read a lot of her, she'll say something on one page and then she'll just take it back and reverse it on a following page. And you might, it, you might not catch it. Um, so you have to, to read slowly and, and carefully. So what she says here down the bottom of the first page after she said that place isn't all that important, then she goes on to say, third, that is third in the list of why, what place is good for, um, place is responsible for the goodness, the worth, in the writer himself. Place is where he has his roots. This is 1950s, y'all, so it's not going to be he or she or she. It's going to be he. This is still the heyday of the dominant male pronoun. I'll start off. <laughs> Place is responsible for the goodness, the worth in the writer himself. Place is where, he, is where he has his roots. Place is where he stands in his experience out of which he writes. It is his experience out of which he writes. It provides the base of reference in his work, the point of view. Let us consider place in fiction in these three wide aspects. So she starts off saying that place isn't all that important, and then she says place is responsible for everything. But what I think is very interesting is how could a writer, as smart as she was in 1954, say that place is respons place is your roots, place defines all your experience, and then never mention that she's a white lady from Mississippi in 1950, and that you know, race has something important to do with her depiction of race, with, with place, race and place. Um, so, you know, whatever it is you come to read and talk about this semester, you should sort of practice, that's not disrespect, but practice that sort of skepticism and self-defense as a reader. I mean, you're, you need to place this essay in its context. Um, then she goes on to say, um, uh, uh, to, to build on that point on the next page. It is by the nature of itself that fiction is all bound up in the local. The internal reason for that is surely that feelings are bound up in place. The human mind is a mass of associations Associations more poetic even than actual. I say the Yorkshire Moors, and you will say Wuthering Heights. And I have only to murmur, if father were only alive, and you would come back with, we could go to Moscow. Five extra points if you can tell me what that's from. No takers? Check off? The cherry orchard, we could just go to Moscow. See, there's a different, this is also, I mean, there's a different sort of level of literacy. And what I, the reason I thought, not to be you know, nasty, although it was sort of nasty, but the point here is that this is also, why is she talking about Chekhov and Bronte when she's a white lady from a segregated southern city in 1954? What's the... You know, does literature somehow have the power 
to override that situation? Uh, do we, you know, does it? Do we want to give it that power? Uh, I think that the, probably the answer to that probably depends on who you ask. Um, the truth is, fiction depends for its life on place. <laughs> it starts off saying place isn't all that important. Then by the time you get to the third page, you know, fiction depends on place or it's nothing. Location is the crossroads of circumstance, the proving ground of what happened, who's here, who's coming. Um, in other words, place determines the meaning of all relationships. You know, a white person and a black person meet on a bus in Chicago in 1955. He's a whole lot different from a white person and a black person meeting on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, or Jackson, Mississippi. It's, just, it's, it's a completely different human interaction. And those humans aren't any different, but the places they come from are different. And so what Welty is arguing here is that place determines character. It determines the breadth and the array of meanings that any given encounter might produce. We are determined by the places that we come from. Now, the question I've been asking lately that I started off with is, what happens when those places we come from are just sort of whoosh, yeah, washed out? Are we capable any longer of any interactions, even evil ones? Can we even be, can we be racist anymore? Well, go ask somebody in Ferguson, Missouri, I suppose. But, um, but you see what I'm getting at here is that Welty's essay and her thinking are rooted in a condition in which, prior to, to our own, clearly, but rooted in one in which she can confidently claim that places are particular that there are real differences, some of them negative. Uh, in her, from her point of view, probably a lot of them negative. That places produce really different human beings. And therefore, you can have really different fictions written by those people. But I'm sort of under the sort of suspicion that we these days, and Gibson and these other authors sort of tell me I might be right, that since we live more or less in a simulated or virtual world, the differences between one and the other of us, except maybe for generations, don't mean what they used to mean. And we may be either gaining by that arguments that, you know, technology makes us smarter, makes us you know, less conscious of racial difference because how can you tell what color somebody's skin is online? Uh, but then at the same time, it also makes us, if, you know, if you believe or this, it also makes us less concrete. It makes us less real. Well, he goes on to say, and I'll sort of wind up with these. These are the most important ones, and these get quoted almost all the time out of her essay. Um, it is our describable outside that defines us. I mean, I blew that one. It is our describable outside that defines us willy-nilly to others. That may save us or destroy us in the world. It may be our shield against chaos, our mask against exposure. But whatever it is, the move we make in the place we live has to signify our intent and meaning. I'm not absolutely sure what I think she means by that. Um, but it's pretty clear that she's repeating that sort of thesis that she has, that there is no person without a distinctively definable place that that person comes from. You can't be you unless you come from a place. And you can only be the you that comes from that place. You can't be another one. 
You can't imagine yourself in some, into another place and be another person. You just can't do it. You get dealt a hand, and that's the hand you play. Of course, this is 1954. This is not 1984. This is not 2004. It's not 2014. It's not the era of Facebook or Instagram uh, or LinkedIn or any of those places where you can create an online personality and get away with it for a while. It's not then. It's not that. Uh, and that may put a limit on what she says. Then the next ex ex excerpt, placed in place in fiction is the named, identified, concrete, exact, and exacting, and therefore credible gathering spot of all that has been felt is about to be experienced in the novel's progress. Location pertains to feeling. Feeling per profoundly pertains to place. Place in history partakes of feeling. You would expect a southerner to add history eventually to this, to this formula. As feeling about history partake, partakes of place. Um, that convoluted quotation of hers gets quoted a lot of times. People are still trying to figure out just exactly what it means. Um, it seems pretty clear anyway to begin with that place, she also adds to place a, a historical dimension. What has happened to people in a place never goes away. Sounds like Poe, doesn't it? Something like that, you know. Um, but she does, I think, at least leave the window open a little bit to believe that she might believe that there is a kind of spirit of place. That anything that happens in a certain place stays in that place. Now that also brings us back around, I think, to where I started from. You know, if we have built over everything, every place, have we eradicated that spirit and therefore impoverished ourselves in some way? We can get to Atlanta in four hours, let's say, on eight lanes of concrete and asphalt. But have we somehow obliterated Joe Johnson's Civil War campaign from Chattanooga to Atlanta? Is it gone? Uh, how many of you have done I-75 from Chattanooga to Atlanta and realized this is the, this is, uh, what's his name, Sherman and Joe Johnson, yeah? I mean, it's hard. You have to, you have to make yourself do it, but, you know, you're, that is still there. That, if you believe it, I mean, that's, the spirit is still there. Uh, it's about, I think, it's uh, time to stop, I think. Uh, or there's there a minute for questions or anything before I scream? Anybody? Not, yeah. People always talk about place when it comes to Southern writers, and yet writers generally try to defy uh, classification because they want a universal appeal. So is there any such thing as a quote, Southern writer, do Southern writers define themselves so much by birth of by being called Southern writers, or is it different? I can answer with an anecdote. I once wrote an essay about William Styron, about his novel Sophie's Choice, in which he tried to argue that the protagonist of that novel, Stingo, is a southerner, and the descendants of slave owners, understood the Holocaust. And I wrote an essay about that, and I sent it to Styron as a sort of, like, you know, compliment. And I got a postcard back from him, <laughs> which he wrote, I have long since given up worrying whether people think I'm a Southern writer or not. So I think the answer to that is, if you ask any Southern writer, you're probably going to get a polite, I'm a writer, but Southern is a critical term, not a writer. Um, and so that's the answer you're probably going to get. Although I do think the real answer is, if you follow Welty, is that a Southern writer is going to write about what he or she knows, and what he or she knows is the South. 
Now, whether the real question is, is there a South left in 2014? Is it still here? You know, does history have a shelf life and we've used it up? Who knows? 